is indeed Christmas, as Ruth reminded us. In the church, we celebrate the 12 days of Christmas beginning on December 25th. And so this is the first Sunday of Christmas. But in real time, in secular time, where you live most of your life, this week we have something else occurring. It is New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And so I suspect there are many of you who are setting some New Year's resolutions as we do this time of year. Some of us start a diet, some decide to exercise, or do something else to increase the quality of our life and our health. I saw a meme on Facebook this week that said somebody thought they should open a gym this week called New Year's Resolutions, and it would have gym equipment for the first two weeks, and then it would turn into a wine bar. <laughs> That is unfortunately how many of our New Year's resolutions tend to work out. I remember making resolutions when I was a teenager. I always had the best of intentions to have a more regular prayer life or scripture reading. I often would re resolve that I was going to read through the Bible in a year. And I'd start in Genesis with the stories of the patriarchs. I might make it through Exodus and the great stories of the plagues and the time in the wilderness. But I usually got lost in Leviticus and the laws, and that was the end of that. The problem with resolutions is that often they just lead to disappointment in ourselves. A feeling of being just not good enough. Now Luther might say that is indeed the function of the law to remind me that I can't be good enough for God. But I wonder at this sense of dissatisfaction that seems to permeate this process of New Year's resolutions with ourselves, with our bodies, with our help, our health, our, our discipline. And so this morning, on the first Sunday of Christmas, we have a text from the Revelation to John. This is a text that does not show up very often in any of our um, liturgical seasons in uh, preaching, and so it is a bit unusual to preach on it. The Revelation is part of an apocalyptic genre in scripture, and this is something that we're not terribly familiar with, so it's a little hard to understand John. I think perhaps some of the things in our modern world that are most like the apocalyptic would be the dystopian genre of literature, like the Hunger Games series. Or for those of us that are a little older, books like George Orwell's 1984 and Big Brother, or Lois Lowry's The Giver. Someone said that uh, apocalyptic can best be understood in art. So we think of the Impressionists, perhaps, or those that do non-realistic looking art that just kind of has symbols that have other meanings that speak to us on a deeper level. Yesterday, I went to the Museum of the Bible in DC. They have a display there through the end of the year called Tapestry of Light. And it is a six panel tapestry woven of the entire book of Revelation. It's woven in uh, fibers that are absorbing of light. So you can see one image in normal light, another in black light, and then another in darkness when it oozes color. There are 
thousands of images in the book of Revelation. Most of them are pretty fearsome and speak of destruction and judgment. But our text for this morning in the 21st book is one of hope. It speaks of a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem. The early church certainly existed in a time of great uncertainty. There was a precariousness to their life. They lived in risk. They were relatively powerless against the Roman Empire. And they were undergoing direct and violent persecution. And so for the first hearers of this message of John, this word of hope was indeed meant to sustain them in a world that did not value them. There are several notable things in this text that I want us to pay attention to. First, this word new in new heaven and new earth. It could also be translated renewed or restoration or perhaps recreation. Someone said it best, I think, when they said, this is not all things new. No, let me try that again. This is not all new things, but instead all things made new. So this is about the perfection of creation being recreated or brought to fruition. So what about that sea being no more thing? I like the sea. I love to go to the ocean and listen to the waves. They're soothing to me. But in the time of the early church, the sea was a symbol for chaos, for evil, for destruction. And so I believe that symbolically, what this vision is telling the church is that evil will be done away with. The power of evil will be put down. It's also notable that this new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. I bet you, like me, have heard or perhaps read stories about the rapture, this time when we will be caught up in the clouds to God. Maybe you've read or heard or seen the movie Left Behind and that fear of not being good enough, not being in the chosen. That's not what Revelation is saying here. Instead, this is a very Christmas picture. God come down to us as Christ came as a baby. God lives among us, is at home with us. The word here in Greek means to tent or to tabernacle, to make a home with us. Creation, the first creation, gives us a picture of a perfect garden. But the humans are relatively alone there. This new Jerusalem, this recreation, is notably different. It is a city, a place of community. In January of 2019, I went to Jerusalem with a group of seminary students. Jerusalem of 2019 is a divided place. In the old city, there's a quarter for the Muslims. There's a quarter for the Orthodox Jews. There's a quarter for the Christians. There are areas where one cannot trespass or go into the other's area. Security checkpoints to get in to the Western Wall, which is a holy spot for the Jewish people. More security checkpoints and an absolute no-go for anyone of Jewish background to get up to the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim Mosque, exists. This Jerusalem, our Jerusalem, is a place of division, of separation. This picture of a new Jerusalem is instead a picture of community, of real, good, healthy intimacy with God and with each other. 
this vision of the absence of evil, of death, of pain, and of tears leads us to hope for a place of justice, of life, of wholeness, and of joy. And the last little image John gives us there is the image of our thirst being quenched. A watering hole on the African savanna where the community gathers to be sustained. Or perhaps a well in a town like that where Jesus met the Samaritan woman. It is a word of satisfaction that answers the dissatisfaction that our resolutions often leave us. <coughs> And does celebrating Christmas and John's revelation tell us about our lives today as we enter the year 2020? It reminds us that Jesus came into the mess and the struggle and is with us. But God is also Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. That very same God who created in wholeness is coming to restore wholeness. And we, we are gods. We are reborn in the waters of baptism into the already and the not yet of the kingdom of God. We are baptized as children of the king. We're part of this new community God is already recreating in wholeness and justice. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, Christmas calls us to see Christ in others, to be Christ to others. You, my friends, are marked with the cross of Christ, as we will recall in our anointing for healing a bit later in the service. As Christ was born, you have been reborn into new life. Thanks be to God.